Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Dr. Yijun Chen. I'm one of the bariatric surgeons at UCLA. Today, we're going to talk about weight loss surgery. What do you need to know? Please feel free to ask us questions. At the end, I'll spend about five minutes to answer all the questions. In this presentation, we're going to cover causes of severe obesity, current medical and surgical treatment op approaches and outcomes, overview of surgical options, and our UCLA program and process. So obesity is defined by BMI, body mass index. It is weight in kilogram divided by height in square meters. Class 1 obesity is BMI between 30 to 34.9. Class 2 obesity is a BMI between 35 to 39.9. Class 3 obesity, or we call it morbid obesity, is defined by a BMI greater than 40. A lot of factors can cause obesity such as genetics, environment, sadly our current food industry, lack of physical activity, and stress. And very sadly, the obesity incidence has increased every year in this country over the last 30 to 50 years. Currently, the latest data suggested that about 37.8 of the U.S. adults are obese. At the same time, was, we saw an increased instance of obesity. We also saw an increased instance of type 2 diabetes. We know that obesity is one of the main risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Obesity can also cause a lot of health issues such as type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, heart disease, fatty liver disease, stroke, asthma, osteoarthritis, cancer, depression, and gout, urinary incontinence, infertility and sexual dysfunction in women, sexual dysfunction in men, venous stasis, asthma, and early death. A lot of people don't know actually obesity can cause cancer. Let's take a look. About 35% of the esophageal cancer, 28% of the pancreatic cancer, 17% of the breast cancer, and shockingly, almost half of the endometrium cancer is associated with overweight or obesity. Obesity can also actually impair your quality of life. It can cause physical limitations, and a lot of obese patients have chronic illness. Also, for a lot of patients, especially young patients, they have a lot of emotional issues if they have obesity. Let's take a look. They may have loss of self-esteem, they may have depression, and they may have to face discrimination. Obesity has been called the last socially acceptable form of prejudice in our society. You may want to ask me, Dr. Chen, I'm obese right now. What is my chance to get to a normal weight range next year. So actually there was a very good study from UK, and this study enrolled at least 100,000 patients, followed them for nine years. And here's the data. So if your BMI is between 30 to 34.9, this is class one obesity, your chance to get to a normal weight range next year is one out of 210 for men, and one out of 124 for women. 
that that is very low. However, you need to remember that when your weight goes up, when your BMI goes up, that chance even goes goes even lower. Take another look. If your BMI is between 40 to 44.9, the chance went down to one out of almost 1,300 for men and one out of 677 for women. A lot of patients have told me that, as you Dr. Chen, I have no issue, I have no problem losing weight in the short term. I just can't keep it. The way I responded in most cases is that you are not alone because so much data has showed the same trend. Let's take a look at one of the most famous trials in the diabetes field. They enrolled obese and pre-diabetic patients. This is called the Diabetes Prevention Program, DPP trial. At the very beginning, they divide the patients into three groups. This line is called placebo, which means that nothing special down to this group of patients. Second group, metformin. These patients took the medication metformin to prevent diabetes. The third group, called the lifestyle group, this group of patients, they have gone through very extensive exercise and dietary consultation. What we saw here is that at first half year and one year, the lifestyle program group of patients, actually they lost about six to seven kilograms. They did pretty well. People were pretty happy. But then what happens was that with time went by, at year two, three, four, five, the weight came back. And at the end of this trial, 10 years, we barely see any difference between three groups. And the lifestyle program patients almost gained all the weight back. There is um, another study recently published I think a lot of us know this show called The Biggest Losers. Sadly, NIH just published the data. Six years after the show, most contestants gained the most lost weight back. Almost all lifestyle intervention trials showed weight loss in the short term. But weight gain all happened in the long term in about anywhere between two to 10 years, just like the DPP trial. So what happened to those patients who lost weight by dieting? So there are two things will happen. One is that once you're on a diet, in most cases, you're gonna have a much increased appetite. Second thing, this is what we found recently, especially from the biggest losers. We found was that after losing weight, the body, shut down the metabolism. They had a much decreased metabolism. So an increased appetite together with decreased metabolism, that brought their weight back. For all these reasons, the obesity experts wrote the comment together. What they said was that diet and exercise alone are no cure for obesity. At UCLA, we do have non-surgical management program for obesity. We have the Comet Clinic, and we have the Risk Factor Obesity Program, RFO program. What are the indications for surgery? Anybody with a BMI more than 40 is eligible to have surgery. Or if your BMI is between 30 to 39.9, but you have one of the comorbidities, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, severe joint pain, or severe fatty liver disease, you also qualify to have surgery. What are the common reasons for people to come to surgeons to have surgery? A lot of obese patients, they take a lot of medications for diabetes, for high blood pressure, for cholesterol. 
And after surgery, the majority of them will take less medications. A lot of patients want to improve their health. They want to have more energy. They want to go down to a certain size or weight. They want to live long enough to see their children or grandchildren to grow. They also want to feel better about themselves. So what are the surgical options? So the gold standard for bariatric surgery is called ruined white gastric bypass surgery. Nowadays, almost all the ruined white gastric bypass surgeries are done laparoscopically, which means very, very small incisions. Very, very small incisions. And this is anatomy after the gastric bypass surgery. During this operation, the surgeons actually do not remove any part of the organ. The main thing they do is that they divide the stomach into two parts. A small pouch, about 30 to 45 cc in volume. And then they bring the small intestine and connect the small intestine to the small pouch. When the patients eat, the food comes down from esophagus to the small pouch, then goes to the small intestine directly. The food bypasses the majority part of this part of the stomach. How about the efficacy of gastric bypass surgery for weight loss in the long term? We know that for medical weight loss, in the long term, efficacy was not good. So we do have data for this operation actually for more than 20 years. So this is one of the best studies from Sweden. And we can see that again, this control group, after 20 years, there was barely any weight change. However, when we look at the gastric bypass surgery group in this line, huge drop at one year, had a little bit of weight regain, but pretty much stabilized at 20 years. So at the end of the 20 years, on average, those patients who had gastric bypass surgery still lost about 25% of their total body weight. For bariatric surgeons, weight loss is not the most important. The most important part are the comorbidities. And from all the data, we know that after weight loss surgery, there's a huge improvement of all the comorbidities. Let's take a look. For migraine, 50%, 57% better. Pseudotumor, almost 100% resolved. High cholesterol, 60% better. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 90% can get improvement if we catch it early. Metabolic syndrome, 80% better. Type 2 diabetes, 83% improvement or resolution. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, 79 to 100% symptomatic relief. Venous stasis, 95% better. Gout, 72% better. Quality of life, 95% better. Depression, 55% better. Sleep apnea, 74 to 98% better. Asthma, 82% better. Cardiovascular disease risk, up to 82% risk reduction. High blood pressure, 52 to 92% better. Reflux, 70 to 90% better with the gastric bypass surgery. Stress urinary incontinence, 44 to 88% better. Joint pain, 41 to 76% better. And in the long term, the mortality can go down as much as 89%. In addition, bariatric surgery can lead to up to 78% reduction of obesity-related cancer risk. It can improve fertility in women and improve sexual function in both men and women. This one disease I really want to talk a little bit more is type 2 diabetes. And we know that weight loss surgery is very effective in treating type 2 diabetes patients, especially if they have obesity. This is a guideline from American Diabetes Association 
talking about bariatric surgery. And this was the old guideline. The old guideline says that bariatric surgery may be considered, considered for adults with BMI more than 35 and type 2 di diabetes. However, with the new evidence, the American Diabetes Association, together with many other international organizations, changed the guideline last June. So let's take a look at the new guideline. So if you have type 2 diabetes and you have a BMI more than 40, the guideline says that you should have expedited assessment for metabolic surgery. And the language is that recommend metabolic surgery. It is the same that if your BMI is actually more than 35 and you have poorly controlled diabetes, the language is the same, recommend metabolic surgery. So we, we can notice a difference. The old guideline was may be considered. The new guideline recommend metabolic surgery. This is a huge change that reflects all the literature, all the data suggesting that weight loss surgery is one of the most effective ways of treating type 2 diabetes if you are obese. And this is a very interesting figure shows how much, how many years of life you can gain from weight loss surgery if you have type 2 diabetes. So let's take a look. There are three lines. This line is a 30-year-old patient. The middle line is a 45-year-old patient. The lower one is a 60-year-old patient. And here is a BMI from 35 to 50 to even 65. Here is how many years of life expectancy you gained because you had weight loss surgery. Let's make it simple. Let's say that, okay, a 45-year-old patient with BMI 45, this patient gained about 6.7 years of life just because this patient had weight loss surgery. But what we really need to know here is that actually the younger the patient is, the less weight the patient has, actually the more life expectancy this patient is, uh, is going to get. So a 30-year-old patient with a BMI of 35 gained about 12 years of life expectancy just because this patient had weight loss surgery. And actually, this gain may be lost if the patient is too heavy. What this shows us is that really, if you have type 2 diabetes, and if you are obese, it's very important for you to have surgery early at a younger age and at a much lower weight. You're going to get much more benefit. If, it, if you let the disease to, to damage your body for too long, the window of opportunity may be lost. There's another operation, actually, a lot of our patients ask us a lot, of, uh, most of the times is this sleeve gastrectomy. Again, almost all surgeries are done laparoscopically, which means very small incisions. So this is a anatomy after this operation. What we can see here is that about 75% of the stomach is removed. I'm going to go over this operation with everybody. The surgeons make five tiny, tiny incisions. This is the original stomach. Then the anesthesiologist insert a tube, we call it a bougie tube, down in the stomach. The surgeons start to use a stabling device to cut the stomach. So we cut the stomach along with this tube so we know how much stomach to, to cut. And we remove this part of the stomach. It's usually about 75%. And after that, we remove this tube. And this is the end result of this operation. The stomach looks like a banana. There are two things will happen after this operation. One is that the volume of the stomach is much smaller. Most patients can only eat about a quarter to a third they used to be, used to be able to eat. Another thing is that we remove this part of the stomach. 
And that part of the stomach is supposed to make hunger hormones. And after that, the vast majority of patients after surgery do not feel that much hungry anymore. What are the advantages of sleep gastrectomy? The main advantage is that during that operation, the surgeons do not touch the small bowel and do not make a new connection. So the complication rate is much, much lower. Also, in this operation, there is no malabsorption. So there is minimal nutri uh, nutritional side effects. For all these reasons, right now, this operation is the most performed bariatric procedure in this country and worldwide. And it's going up almost every year. However, for sleeve gastrectomy, we do not have the data beyond 10 years. And a very small amount of patients may develop some heartburn. The operating time for gastric bypass surgery is about two to three hours. For sleeve gastrectomy, it's much shorter. It's about 40 minutes to an hour in most cases. Most patients can go home after one to two nights stay in the hospital. And most can go back to work after about two weeks. Uh, almost everybody heard this operation called the lab band. S seems like a very, very simple operation and uh, there's no need to cut the stomach, no connection, and it seems like uh, the perfect operation. Uh, the problem with the lab band is that in the long term, up to about a third of the patients may have some complications. Nowadays, in all the major U.S. centers, almost all of them, we're taking out more bands than we put in. And uh, a lot of centers have stopped doing this operation. At the UCLA, we actually we can remove the lab band and revise to a much, much better operation, such as sleeve gastrectomy or ruin white gastric bypass surgery. What are the potential complications for bariatric surgery? There's a small chance for heart attack, wound infection, urinary tract infection, pneumonia, PE. There's a very small chance for leak, marginal ulcer, stricture, bleeding, bowel obstruction, nutrient deficiency for gastric bypass patients. So the leak rate right now is about 1%. There's a 1 to 2% chance for some bleeding. Uh, there's a small chance for reflux and a very, very small chance for nutritional problem. We can see here between 2002 to 2009, the in-house mortality for this operation went down by almost sevenfold. And nowadays in this country, the chance to die from a gallbladder surgery is about 0.7%. For hip replacement, it's about 0.9%. Weight loss surgery, 0.1%. So we believe that nowadays, weight loss surgery is very safe. So actually, for patients with morbid obesity, especially if you have comorbidities, not having surgery is much more dangerous than having surgery in the long term. Because first, obesity is dangerous. Second, the bariatric surgery not only is safe, but also has been shown to reduce the chance of dying early by 50 to 89 percent in 5 to 10 years. A few years ago, we did a survey, asked our past patients, and we asked them about their quality of life after weight loss surgery. And we can see here about 95 percent of the patients felt that their quality of life either markedly improved or improved. We went even further, we asked them whether or not the decision to have weight loss surgery was one of the best decisions they ever made. And again, about 95% of them fully agree or agreed. And 95% of them had a great experience. We do believe that outcome reflect preparation. We really like you know, all our patients to get a very good education, to control the comorbidity before surgery, to change the lifestyle before surgery, and to
to have a psychological evaluation. And if you want to come to our program to have a surgery, please feel free to give us a call. Or you can visit us on the website. And at the initial appointment, you're going to see one of our surgeons and a dietitian. On a follow-up appointment, you're going to see one of the psychologists. We do see our patients a lot after surgery. We see them at two weeks, three months, six months, and one year after surgery. And even after that, we don't let them go. We still see them every year. In summary, bariatric surgery leads to long-term weight loss. The benefits of bariatric surgery go beyond weight loss in itself. Bariatric, bariatric surgery is safe. And education and preparation are essential for success. All right, time for questions. All right, here are some questions. The first question is that, will my insurance cover the surgery? The answer is that that depends on your insurance. However, at this moment, about, I will say about 80 or 90% of the patients in California do have bariatric surgery coverage. For most patients with PPO insurance, and the insurance will cover for surgery. And for most patients with HMO insurance, actually the surgery is covered. And another question is that, uh, how much pain will I have after surgery? Because we do a laparoscopic surgery, the incisions are much, much smaller. So most of our patients don't have too much pain. They may have some pain right after surgery, but the next day, by the time they, they are about to go home, the pain usually is minimal. Very few patients take more than 10 pills of pain medications after discharge. Another question is that, uh, will I have excess skin after weight loss? Uh, that depends. It will depend what age you have surgery, how much weight you lose. The general rule is that the younger you have surgery, the less problem you're going to have. The more weight you lose, the more excess skin you may have. So in our experience, it's that about 30% of the patients after in one to two years, they may go to see a plastic surgeon to discuss the need to remove the excess skin. But 70% of the patients, they don't need. Here's another question. I work from home. Can I start to work a few days after surgery? So that is totally possible. So we do not encourage our patients to go back to work within the first week. However, if you can work from home and uh, a few hours uh, you know, a day, uh, three or four days after surgery, I think that's totally reasonable. I do warn my patients that the first two weeks after surgery, they may feel that they don't have much energy. Actually, that's not from the pain of the surgery. It's mostly from the low calorie diet the liquid diet after surgery. And after two weeks or so, actually, when you, most patients will lose about 14 to 20 pounds with that weight loss, and most patients start to eat softer food, you're going to feel that actually you may have more energy after two to four weeks. What is my chance of having weight regain in the long term? This is the last question. Um, we usually say that the long-term success rate for bariatric surgery for either gastric bypass surgery or sleep is about 85 to 90%. So the chance for you to regain a lot of weight is about 10 to 15% in the long term. That's still much, much better than any medical weight loss, including the Biggest Loser show. All right. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, if you have any other questions, please give us a call in my office. We are very happy to answer all the questions. Thank you.